Okay, so that's that's where I, I am this morning uh, in, in response to the first question. This is a, a view from my office window uh, across Muscat out to the mountains. So in Amman, and it seems like we've got people joining us across the GCC and uh, across uh, the world. So coming back to what I was just talking about in terms of you know, how we're all feeling this morning, um, yeah, and, and you know, with some really positive thoughts coming through there, but I'm, I'm sure we've all been working with colleagues and I'm sure if we're probably honest ourselves, some of our feelings in the, in the last six months have, have been you know, not always very positive. And so as a leader, you know, words which have become and, 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 and behaviours which have had to become front and centre of, of what we do as leaders, I, I'm feeling, are around empathy, uh, compassion and gratitude. And I don't think these were, you know, the top within the top 10 sort of attributes of leadership, uh, perhaps back in you know, 10, 10 years ago. But I think they are front and centre now uh, in leadership of any type of organisation. So, so if we're trying to be even more empathetic, compassionate as leaders, how, how can we help our team members? How can we help our colleagues uh, physically, cognitively, emotionally in these difficult times? And I'm sure fellow leaders, whether you're a head of school or you're head of a section or you're head of department or if you're a leader of a classroom, uh, you know, you, you'll be asking yourself that that question. Uh, what can I do to make make the well-being of my students, my colleagues, maybe just a little bit better? And so I think one of the ways into this, one of the ways into this is actually engaging with, with perhaps the most fundamental educational question and the question of purpose. You know, what are we doing every day in our schools in our classrooms, with our students, with our with our uh, teachers, with our colleagues, what is the purpose of what we're doing? Um, and if I asked you, you know, if you're in a school, if I said, "What is the vision for your school?" Would you be able to articulate that? Maybe. Would you be able to say that day in day out you live into that vision? And what might that mean? Do you own that vision? Do you feel that vision? Do you live it every day? Now, you may be able to say, yep, no problem. Or you might say, well, yeah, somebody's imposed that vision or vision. We haven't got, I, I don't know what our vision is. Um, but the, the, the second question, which I'm going to spend a bit more time on this morning, is what about the vision for the type of students that we're trying to nurture in our schools? Are we all in education really clear about that vision? And in the schools we work in or the teams we work in, are we clear about that vision for the type of student that we are trying to nurture day in, day out? Because if we are, if we're really clear about that, does that help us get through this, this challenging time? Because it gives us a real sense of purpose. However challenging the world we are trying to work through and navigate through, However hard that is, if we've got a clear sense of purpose about what we're trying to do minute by minute, hour by hour, day in, day out, does it help us get through? And the, the third question, which I'll touch a little bit on, is if we're really clear about the type of student that we're trying to nurture, then what is the learning and the teaching that's going to help nurture that particular type of student? So if I take uh, you back six years and you know, not just ask questions, I'll actually give a, a sort of practical example of how we put that into practice here in Muscat. If you go back six years, summer of 2014, um, we, we really felt we, 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 it was important, but it was a time that we needed to ask our, our colleagues this question. And, and we framed the question as what are, what are our or what are your desired outcomes for education for our children in our school? What is the purpose of what we're trying to do every day? What are the desired outcomes of education? And clearly asking that question doesn't cost anything. Uh, it costs in time and it costs time in listening to, to colleagues and thinking through their responses and trying to group those together. But it actually doesn't cost anything um, in the same way as a, a new building would or a new lot of computers with or whatever. It's a very low cost uh, strategy. But of all the things that I think we've done in the last six years here in Muscat, I think potentially this has been the most powerful change in our school because it has really helped to change the culture. It's given us a language for learning, for teaching. Uh, the staff own the, 
the outcome of what I'm going to share with you. And it's had a really powerful, profound and sustained impact on the culture of our school. And it all started by asking this question, what are the desired outcomes for education for our students in our school? And we uh, asked that question in a number of staff meetings over the summer of 2014. And a group of colleagues after the first staff meeting said, Kai, I'd really like to work on this. I'd like to gather these responses together, what the staff are talking about, and we'll, we'll pull that together and we'll, we'll bring you something back at the, the end of the term. How about that? Brilliant. So what they came back with at the end of the term, having thought about you know, the future that we're preparing our students for, you know, and not our past, but their future, and this is a little snapshot from some Canadian futurologists they were doing some work thinking, you know, what might the jobs of 2030 might look like? And they came up with this idea of a rewilder. And they think a rewilder is somebody who would uh, resurrect desecrated environmental areas. And this is maybe a, a job for the future, if not for the present. So we thought about the future that we're preparing our students for and lots of discussion around the purpose of the education that we're providing in our school. And this is what my colleagues came up with. They come up with three broad things that we're trying to do in terms of purpose for the type of student we're trying to create. Secure individuals. So individuals that are confident, responsible, risk takers. That's our first level, you know, that they're safe, they're confident, responsible, risk takers. They feel confident to learn. They're secure to learn. Secondly, that we want to create resourceful learners, you know, whatever learning they may achieve while they're in our school, beyond our school. They're, and, you know, they will be resourceful learners as lifelong learners and you know developing attributes like curiosity being reflective creative resilient motivated these are all captured in that resourceful learner outcome and the final area was we felt that we wanted our students to be respectful contributors community-minded collaborative open-minded so we had these three areas and the colleagues then put this together and said well why don't we call this our BSM learning ethos. Because I think like a lot of international schools, we we may have had some sort of ethos before this, which was maybe loosely articulated, but unlike some of the established, certainly independent schools in the UK, who have been going for three or 400 years and are very, very clear about their ethos. We, we didn't really have that clarity to our ethos. So, uh, if you look at another area of work that we've started to do some work on, Professor Debray's high performance learning work, uh, she talks about world class schools and she identifies 10 categories uh, or, or features of world class schools. And sh she says from her research, the first thing that world class schools do is they start by focusing on the profile of the type of student they want to develop. And that's what we were doing by, by answering that question. What are the desired outcomes for education for our children? We've created this profile, this learning ethos of the type of student we want to develop. So we then use that to influence the curriculum, and I'll share that in a moment. But what we've also done is we've made that explicit to our students and explicit to our parents that that's the purpose of education in our school and what we're trying to achieve. So here's that learning ethos. Uh, presented in a way that probably makes sense to some of the younger learners in our three to 18 school. Um, and you can see you know, th this has certain appeal. And then certainly in foundation stage, they created an even more you know, child friendly version of our learning mm -hmm. ethos. So we've, we've shared that very much uh, with our community. And then uh, I just sort of came across this a few days on, on Twitter, and I think it's from International uh, Leader is a Twitter handle. No, no, it's not attributed to anybody, but it, but it really captured, captured my attention because in the best schools, it says the mission and the ethos of the school is deeply embedded in the curriculum. And so one of the, the first things that my colleagues did, once we'd established our, our learning ethos and we'd answered that question about desired outcomes, they started to look at the curriculum, especially in EYFS and foundation stage, and they said, well, Here's some FS children. What's wrong with what's wrong with FS? What's wrong with Key Stage One? Can we use our ethos to redesign learning in FS and in Key Stage One? Because I think probably like a lot of schools, 
uh, the the open, free flowing, active learning of FS. When those children moved into key stage one, they suddenly were faced with a much more formal version of learn, learning, which a lot of the children found challenging. Um, and that didn't really seem to embrace the values which we were articulating in our ethos. So we used our learning ethos to uh, redesign FS even further. There had been a lot of redesigning going on for a number of years. So we really sharpened up the design of the foundation stage. But then what that did do, that philosophy of active learning, collaborative learning, child-centered play, we brought a lot more of that into years one and two. And so the formality of our years one and year two literally went out of the window. And uh, it was quite an interesting change process, this one. Uh, I mean, I think it's really important to give your colleagues autonomy. Um, and sometimes what you then face with is a pile of furniture outside the key stage one building two days before the start of term. And I didn't know what on earth was going on. Uh, so what I found out when I went to look what was behind the, the throwing out of all this furniture was the redesign of the learning environment in key stage one into a more workshop based environment. So they didn't need so many tables and chairs anymore because they were really creating a, an environment which was much more like, more, much more like foundation stage. So um, we, we've been running that program now for more than three years and it's evolved as we've gone along. And we've really been working out the balance of I think what Tom Sherrington calls mode A and mode B. You know, what is the right balance of direct instruction? And there still is direct instruction in years one and two, but also what's the right balance alongside that with, with more project-based, child-centered, you know, play, activity-oriented learning. So year one and year two was the, was the first major area which took a, a redesign with the learning ethos driving that, because through this approach, to learning, we felt, and my colleagues felt, that the learning ethos could be much better lived day in, day out. And then that progressed into year three and year four. So introduced, again, much more project-based learning into three and four, and now also in, in years five and six. So we didn't just ask the question, what's our purpose? What are our desired outcomes for education? And then end up with a learning ethos and a clear view of the type of student we wanted to create. My colleagues then in particularly the primary school started thinking very much about, well, how does the curriculum lend itself to that learning ethos? And how does our pedagogy lend itself to that ethos? So then, uh, you know, an interesting sort of theoretical framework just to, to bear in mind here. Um, this is from Guy Claxton and Bill Lucas from uh, an SSAT publication 2013. And they talk about the 10 dimensions of expansive pedagogy. And certainly what, what I think we've done uh, in the redesign of our primary curriculum is we've moved to a better balance. And so what we're not saying here is the items on the right of the slide are wrong and the items on the left are right. But what we're saying is, I think, we, I think what Claxton and Lucas are saying, in, a, in an expansive pedagogy paradigm, you'd have a much better balance of the ex, of the of the dimensions on the left uh, with the dimensions on the right. So quite interesting. Yeah, do we realize we've all been doing a lot of expansive pedagogy in the last uh, six months as we've gone from face to face to virtual learning in terms of proximity of the teacher. But in terms of our redesign of particularly key stage one, we've gone much more from a classroom uh, space to a workshop space. Um, and the role of the teacher from less emphasis on didactic teaching to more facilitative and so on. So it's quite an interesting framework, I think, to, to, to reflect on our own practice uh, in our own classrooms, wherever we are across sort of three to 18 uh, continuum. You know, where, where, where would our lessons fit on, this, on, the, on these 10 different dimensions? Okay, so that was really the second question. You know, the first question was, what's the vision for your school? The vision for our school for the last 10 years has been we want to be a leading international school. The second question, which I've just gone through our responses to, was what are desired outcomes for education? Um, and the third question then is what is the learning and teaching that, that are going to result in those desired outcomes for education? So having established our learning ethos uh, three years ago, 
we came across uh, Professor Debre's high performance learning framework. And we felt that this framework, which is very flexible, gave us a framework to work with to shape that our response to that question about what is the learning and what is the teaching that will lead to the students that we're trying to create. And very much at the bottom of this, this diagram, this framework, you know, the values, attitudes and attributes and the advanced cognitive performance characteristics, those are very similar to our learning ethos. And you can see that's at the foundation of this model of high performance learning. So we, were, we found it felt relatively easily to insert our learning ethos and adapt our learning ethos into that foundation and then use the rest of the framework to start to shape our approach to teaching and learning in a, in a much more systematic way. So if you look at the pillars here, you know, feedback, engagement with, with parents, with students, not to them, mindset shift, inquiry-based learning, these are probably all things that many schools are doing, but this flexible framework give, gives some cohesion to that, underpinned by a learning ethos or ways of thinking and ways of behaving. Um, but it also is in a culture, an explicit culture of high expectations. So we've started using that three years ago. We're still doing a lot of work on that. Um, but the attitudes, the values, attitudes, and attributes, and the ACPCs that Deborah's High Performance Learning Framework works with are very much research-based. And so it's given, it, given our learning ethos an even stronger research dimension. So what's been the impact of answer, answer, asking this question, what are the, the desired outcomes of education for our students? Well, we do an, an annual parent survey. And when we did that survey back in 2013, and we asked our parents before we had the BSM learning ethos in place, are we preparing your child for the future? 80% parents, 80 of parents thought that we were. Once the learning ethos had been in, uh, in place for five years, that had gone up to 93% of parents thought that we were preparing their children for the future. So that's quite an interesting change. And uh, another indicator, less quantitative, but what I'm very proud of is that when visitors come to our school, when we're open, and uh, we've actually been closed since March, and we're looking to reopen on the 1st of November, but we've been online for, for you know, since the 15th of March, so that's another story. Uh, but, but when we were open, and when we reopen, uh, when visitors come to our school and they and, and they talk about our students, the three three words or phrases they use most commonly about our students are that they are kind, they are generous, and they are quietly confident. And that I'm very proud of. So I think uh, we, we're probably going to move into the the question time now. But one of the questions you might be asking yourself is if you're going to ask that question to your school, to your team that you work with maybe, or even yourself, what are, what are the risks involved and, and how might you manage those? Okay, I'll, I'll stop there and, uh, and if there are any questions, uh, happy to, to take those. Brilliant, thank you so much. There's so much to unpick from all of that, Kai. And it's just what's really interesting, I think, um, is 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 the, the, those attributes that you were looking to do? Um, wh whilst you were reading through those, it, it did strike me there's there, there seemed to be some parity there between uh, the things that you might want to um, sort of support your learners with, linked to Maslow's hierarchy of needs about providing that support and or get, getting one of those physiological things in place in order to once you've got those things in place, you can then sort of build them up. And, and, and was was that any part of your thinking behind all of this? Well, I think, uh, yes, I think, I mean, so to be clear, this, so this wasn't my thinking. This was the, the thinking of my colleagues. And I think when, when they went off to, uh, so, you know, I thought we, we, we were originally going to deal with this question in one staff meeting. And, and, and the discussions went on all, all summer because that, just that one question, you know, what are the desired outcomes for education in our, in our school, sparked off a whole range of questions. And yes, and I think I think you're right. Uh, I think a number of staff did did discuss uh, Maslow's hierarchy and and you know making sure that children are safe and secure. You know that is the absolute starting point. You, if they don't feel safe and secure, they're not going to start learning. So there were discussions about that. There were discussions about the IB learner profile. There were discussions about a similar 
uh, idea that they had in Singapore schools. There were discussions about the role of happiness is in the role of schools just to make sure the children are happy. Yeah, so we had some really deep and meaningful conversations about the, the purpose of education. It was it was brilliant. Mm. That's, that's really, really good to hear. And, and as I, involving your stakeholders in these sorts of things, you know, really does sort of bring buy-in from colleagues and things as well, which clearly has been the case for you at the, the school. Uh, I'm just looking through all the various comments um, here, Kai, so if there's any specific questions for you. There's certainly uh, some residents um, in terms of agreement with what you've been talking about. Catherine, for example, shares um, she, uh, the balance of these various dimensions is really delicate but necessary to meet the multiple uh, learner types that you have in there. Um, uh, 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 Krishna uh, Asanal, I think it is, um, also says uh, that she's loving the uh, learning ethos. You've got people um, clearly from, from your school in supporting as well. Um, uh, we've got the We Are BSM hashtag going on in the chat as well, Kai. I, I, maybe that's a, a colleague of yours. Uh, I, I'm not quite sure. But um, if you do have any um, questions for Kai related to what you shared, please do pop those through in the chat. Um, Al Kingsley, um, who's speaking later today, he's up early um, here in the UK. He's uh, sharing his lovely dislike there with empathy and well being being at the heart of the discussion. Uh, so involving all the stakeholders there as well. Um, but, um, this may, might have been Ollie who typed this about uh, loving the messages of agency collaboration and being open minded. Was, yeah. uh, when, when the Learn Live UAE account uh, sends a message, you, you'll have to sort of take a pick as to whether it's me writing it or Ollie, but I know that definitely <laughs> wasn't me who said that one. Uh, let's see if you've got any uh, questions uh, come through. Uh, no, no, no questions uh, come through as of yet. How about yourself, Ollie? Do you have any questions for Kai based on what he shared? Yeah, obviously. Um you alluded to the fact that it, it takes time and it's been a, a five-year journey to get to the point where you are now. It sounds like um, the work that you've done has, has, has been passionately uh, engaging for, for the teachers, um, which is of vital importance. And you talked about the kind of triangulation of information with, with everybody involved, parent, teacher, student. Um, how quickly did the students respond to it? Because quite often they they can go one of two ways. So um, they can either throw themselves into it immediately or it takes a little bit of time um, to sort of steer the ship, as it were. Um, I think they, they brought it in, into it fairly quickly. I mean, I think as, as you saw, you know, the example I shared with you, because I feel that the, 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 the my colleagues felt they owned this, they were very they were very keen to to interpret it in their own way in their in their part of the school with their children so you know the fs uh, team for example did a did a very child friendly version uh, for for their very young children with resilient spiders uh, for example and you know they, they actually had these physical soft toy spiders in the classroom um so so the children took to it uh, particularly well especially uh, the younger children. I think it's more challenging, and I think you have to think maybe a bit more carefully about how you introduce this type of thing for for older students. Uh, but certainly in the primary school, uh, the children were living and breathing this very quickly, as were the, my colleagues. And when we were sort of two thirds way through 2015-16, no, 2014-15, and I was sitting in a governors meeting, and one of the parents started saying. So, so what, what's all this learning ethos stuff that my child comes home talking about? Uh, it, it's absolutely brilliant. Uh, and, and at that point, I thought, wow, you know, we, we are making, you know, this, this is something more than just something on a website or in a prospectus. We are living yeah. and breathing this learning ethos, not just across the school, but across the school community. And when your, the parents start playing that language back to you and mm -hmm. understanding means and talk to their children about it and that's coming back in from the parents you then you then feel that you know, it is genuinely or authentically embedded right across the school community that's great to hear We've, you've actually answered the first part of this question uh, from nicola thanks for tuning in nicola um clearly it is embedded um i'd like to ask you the second part as well where next what's next in the journey where next so um I think what we are what we are doing, uh, we 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 have embedded that learning ethos within our high performance learning framework, um, and and that's even more more sort of extensive in its scope to to change things. So, 
we're still w working through. I said we're in our third or fourth year now of working with Debra's high performance learning framework. So we want to keep on pushing that forward. Um, and I think, you know, we've done a really good job of this in the primary school. Uh, we've done a good job of it in the senior school. But but I'd, I'd, I'd like to see the the, 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 the the design and the redesign of aspects of the curriculum that's happening in the primary school more having more of an impact in the senior school. And I know that's more difficult because of uh, GCSE syllabuses and A-level syllabus and that sort of thing and the pressure that senior colleagues are under. And, and we have started to do that with our work in Salala, you know, uh, where we, I haven't got time to talk about it today, but we've, we've introduced a flexed ed program. And, and, and the reason, you know, one of the reasons we've been able to come up with that very flexible key stage four program in Salala is because we've asked them that very simple question, what really matters at key stage four? What do we really need to do? And what maybe can we, 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 we leave on the side? Uh, but I'll be sharing Flexed or Flex Ed uh, at the Outstanding Schools Conference, I think, later in November. And there's also an article on our blog. Yeah, we'll have to get you back to talk about it more on the show as well, Kai. Sure, sure, yeah. yeah. So, really, so really I think, I think I, I, yeah, I mean, I think I'd just like to end, I think we're probably over time, but I mean, I, I'm increasingly uh, energised, excited and inspired by the work of Brené Brown. Uh, I've started to explore her book, Dare to Lead, and what she identifies uh, as one of the, the key aspects of leadership is that identify your core values and then live into them, which sounds maybe a bit American, and then practice them and live them. And, and I really like that, that idea. And I think that's what we're trying to do here in Muscat with our learning ethos. We've identified what those values are and we're trying to uh, lead into them. I think that the final word I'll give to Susan Scott, I'm not sure how many of our participants have come across her work, Fierce Conversations in particular is well known. And then she's also more recently written Fierce Leadership. And she, she says, if you want to become a great leader or a great human being, you must gain the capacity to, to connect with the people who are important to you at a deep level or lower your aim. And I think the, the, one of the ways which we can uh, connect and develop that capacity with our colleagues is to ask them deep and meaningful questions like, what are we doing here? What's the purpose? What are we trying to do with our students? Uh, and I say, you know, coming back to the start, I think if we are really clear about our purpose as education professionals, then I think that can help maybe just a little bit, maybe a, a, a bit more than just a little bit to get through the, the tough time that we're going through. And if, uh, if um, uh, people want to hear a bit more about, read more about what we've done, uh, by, all means, by all means, check into our blog, uh, blog.bridgeschoolmuscat.com. Uh, you can read all about our learning ethos uh, article number one, and uh, there's another another series of articles there about work that's going on at the school. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Kai. And, and there's clearly an appetite for further discussion as well from the questions that are coming through on the side as well. Unfortunately, we're out of time and uh, we need to get Mark uh, on to do his session now. But um, we'll, we'll save these questions. Maybe if you've got the capacity to uh, sort of dig into that in the chat, that'll still be there live in YouTube uh, for you okay. to uh, pop to there, Kai. But thank you so much for your time. And thank you so much for opening our, our day today. Uh, some fantastic messages there for everybody viewing and some great follow up things to do as well. Blog.britchschoolmuscat.com uh, to find out more there. And you can connect with Kai at Principal Must. Uh, on Twitter as well. Uh, thank you so much uh, indeed, Kai. I'm going to drop you back out into the green room now. Um, and okay. uh, thank you, so much and thank you that, that, to, to your phone for being so effective at saving the day on the connectivity. Thank you so much, Kai. Thank yeah, you. Always be prepared. Well, thanks, Mark. Thanks, Ali. Uh, thanks, thanks, everybody, Kai. for tuning in today. And uh, good luck with the rest of the show. Been brilliant. Yeah, brilliant. And very privileged to be part of that. Thank you. Oh, happy. Thank, thank you. you. We, we feel the same way about you joining us as well, Kai. Thank you very much. Okay, take care.